Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming out and being part of this very important conversation uh, for what it means to be the church and how we work out and be the church together. As we gather, it's going to be a little different than our last town hall. There are not a um, ton of PowerPoints, but I want us to um, kind of, here's what we're going to accomplish today or hope to accomplish is to... Uh, talk about what's happened since we met last in the town hall, which was on November 8th, uh, and some of the actions that have been taken, some of the moves that have been undertaken by this congregation, some of the information that we have received from the denomination, uh, and um, also some of the feedback from what occurred when we gathered last. But as we gather, I, I want us to do so in a, a sense of, of worship and being in the presence of God. One thing that we can all agree on is that this is God's church and we are doing our best to be God's people. And therefore, we are called to model Christian love and care for each other. Uh, and so I, I ask that we invite God's presence into this place collectively. If you would, take out your hymnal, and I'm not going to lead you in a song, so don't, don't worry. But, uh, look to Psalm 121, which is on page 844 of your hymnal. This is a psalm that reminds us just who is our help? What is our primary resource? How do we um, not get lost in taking care of things all on our own? The, and so what I'd like for us to do is to, if you would, I invite you to stand and read this responsively. And of course, if you all would, please read what is written in bold. I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence does my help come. The Lord will not let your foot be moved. The Lord who keeps you will not slumber. The Lord is your keeper. The sun shall not smite you by day. The Lord will keep you from all evil and will keep you keep your life. And if you would, turn over to page 881. Many of you will not need this as this is um, deep within your souls. This is the Apostles' Creed. Um, it is the essentials of our faith. What I pray that we can, with no ambiguity whatsoever, agree 100% upon the basic bedrock of Christian faith. Again, we'll be reading the traditional version, uh, 881. Please join me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Let us pray. Good and gracious Lord, as we have gathered in your name, remind us that we are all sinners in need of your grace. We are all people who are on their way to becoming something more than hopefully what we were when we woke up this morning. Lord, help us to hold each other with love, care, and respect. Help us to hear from each other, as ultimately our goal is to hear from you. Lord, you have brought forth this congregation. You called forth faithful people a long, long time ago, way back in 1884, to begin a worshiping body here in this place. And we stand upon the, upon the shoulders of those who came before us. 
And so, Lord, by the strength of your Holy Spirit, as we have conversations about things that, are, that can be difficult and hard, we ask that your healing spirit be with us. We also ask that your will be done. Lord, when we gather in so many venues in this place, we pray exactly that, that your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Lord, we need your will to be lived out for the life of this church. May it be so. In the name of Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, so quickly want to uh, give this update. And I also want you to know that there is no end time on this. Uh, I want to make sure everybody has the chance to say whatever they may feel God has put on their hearts or ask any question that God has put on their hearts. And, that, and I will not be the only one answering these questions. There are many people in here who've done a lot of work to understand this situation. And uh, so answers may come from any quarter. But it's important for you all to know that, um, that we have clarity in this and that there's that... If you have a question, don't please don't leave here without getting it answered to the best of our ability. We will not have all the answers. You all already know that. But we will do our best, and we will uh, do so in all honesty and integrity, uh, honoring the God whom we worship. So on November 8th, we gathered here. Um, we had about 100 and anywhere from 115 people, I think was the number of one count. We had a, another 20 people or so join online. And this is online too. It's being live streamed. So uh, I know there's some folks who asked for that. So, And it will also be recorded and placed on the website if you want to share it with anybody at a later time. Again, everything's out in the open um, we had a conversation we were presented a lot of different material. We did went through a PowerPoint about basic options that are available to congregations. And the gist of it, uh, uh, just to go over it one more time, is that the United Methodist Church is currently in a time of turmoil. Um, that turmoil is largely centered around what will be, what will the church look like in the future? That's a, that's a big open-ended statement, right? But uh, some of it comes down to what will be the church's role and how we uh, are in ministry along the lines of human sexuality. Some of the presenting problems are not uh, problems, issues, concerns are, will the church officiate same-sex marriage? marriages in the, in the churches? Will pastors be openly professing uh, gay uh, LGBTQ community members? So those are some of the issues. There are other issues about concerns about bishops who have not lived up to the Book of Discipline. Currently, the United Methodist Book of Discipline reads that uh, Homosexuality is incompatible with Christian teaching. That's in the, the rules and that we do not do marriages or orda ordination uh, along those lines. So those are some of those issues that are bubbling up. And I, I think, uh, I hope you're well aware of those, um, those presenting issues that we talked about when we gathered on November 8th. We went through all these things. We had some conversation. We had some uh, people state their position from the floor about what they feel and think about the future of the church. And then we asked for your feedback, or I asked for your feedback. You were given an index card and said, basically, write whatever you want to write on it. The feedback from those, and again, this is not a straw poll because we did not ask any specific questions, just opened it up to what do you want to say. Um, and it was interesting. We had, it, it really looked like a bell curve um, for all practical purposes. We had about 25 or so people who said we should stay with the United Methodist Church. We even had people on, on that side who said we should develop a more progressive approach or liberal approach to marriage and ordination. <laughs> So that was represented in that feedback. We had people on the other end of the spectrum that said that um, we should leave the United Methodist Church uh, over this issue and we should disaffiliate. So we had about 20 or so people on that side. In the middle were a whole lot of people who said, uh, well, not sure. Uh, some people said, I think we should wait till 2024, which is when the general conference meets to maybe 
<laughs> once and all settle this, but if you've been part of the United Methodist Church, you know that we hardly ever once and forever settle anything. So, um, and we had people who said they were leaning towards staying. We had some who said they were leaning towards going. And so it really was a bell curve. Um, and what, if there's one takeaway from this, it's that we've got people all over the place. We have people who, are, who love God, who follow Jesus, who aren't in the same place on this subject. That's, if there's one thing we can say unequivocally, it's that we all have varying degrees of opinions about this. So, um, so that was the, the overall feedback that was shared with the administrative board. It was shared with our advisory team. The advisory team on November 29th met. They took the feedback into consideration. Um, and the advisory team, this is a team we've had together since 2018 to stay abreast of developing situations within the United Methodist Church. The advisory team, after, um, after a, a meeting, uh, we had about a two hour meeting where this was uh, discussed, the advisory team voted to recommend to the administrative board that the church begin the disaffiliation process. That was the recommendation from the advisory team. Is everybody clear on that? Um, only the so that recommendation went to the administrative board on December 20th. The administrative board gathered to consider that recommendation. Uh, and in the meantime, we did get a new piece of information from our district superintendent. Here's the communication from him um, about timelines and procedure. And there's a copy of this up here if anybody would like it. I'm not going to read through it all. I'll just cut to the chase of what he said. It basically um, said that the Bishop Carter, the Bishop of the Western North Carolina Annual Conference, and I'll, I'll just quote this part, is going to have a called annual conference to vote on disaffiliations next fall so that churches who desire to leave can do so before the sunset of paragraph 2553 in the Book of Discipline, which is December 31st, 2023. This is a, an official communication from the district that is um, making that statement, and it has been entered into the minutes of our administrative board. So with this information, the administrative board voted to form a task force uh, to put together a group of people to lead the effort to educate, provide clarity, and basically run the process where that the church will most likely uh, take a vote in probably October as to what the church will do. That's where we are right now. The um, administrative board meets on January 24th to confirm, approve, elect this discernment task force, and then they will take over the work of leading these conversations. And it will be their job to communicate to the congregation relevant information. Uh, it will be their job to answer any questions you may have about what is about what um, the church does and how the process is moved forward. Again, with the probable vote sometime in October by the church body as to what this church will choose to do. Um, any questions? I know that's a lot, but any questions anyone has about where we are right now? Okay, Carrie? Do you, what? My understanding of what the advisory group sent to the administrative board was a recommend, recommendation to put a plan together. It did not recommend that we disaffiliate. No. Uh, it did not. It, it, but it, it said to, it, the language was that we begin the disaffiliation process, correct? No. The actual wording did not 
mention anything about disaffiliating. It mentioned the recommendation that the administrative board develop a plan and left it there with details as to what should be included in that plan. Okay, well, thank you for that clarification, Carrie. Uh, all of that is in the minutes of the administrative board, um, and thank you for that clarity. But the, the at the at the heart of this is, an, it was the administrative board. Um, the administrative board. The, I'll, I'll just read this. This is the, what was brought before the administrative board. Pursuant to the advisory group meeting on November 29th, 2022, a recommendation is hereby submitted to the DUMC administrative board to prepare an action plan to determine the future direction for DUMC with respect to the current ongoing conflict within the United Methodist Church. Um, is that the, the action plan should take into account the options available to a local church and through the prudent examination of each option, include the collection and valuation of as much factual information as possible. These options and all relevant information gathered and pertaining thereto should be shared with the congregation to ensure that they are all well informed. The plan should also include a timeline that will ultimately lead to a vote by the members of the congregation to determine if DUMC will remain in the United Methodist Church for the foreseeable future or choose to disaffiliate. With respect to the process leading up to this vote, this plan should be approved by the district superintendent, the Catawba Valley District. Should a vote result in a decision by the congregation to disaffiliate, all required actions are to be completed in order to meet the established deadline for receiving approval to disaffiliate from the Western North Carolina Conference. The plan should also address any actions that would be required and are necessary for the church to take following a disaffiliation and the matter in which such actions would need to be taken. Uh, so again, those are in the minutes of the administrative board. Um, and the, so the administrative re board's uh, response to this was to, um, is to form a task force uh, because we had we had some folks come and, and say they they to, they would like to see more information provided so that people can make uh, the best informed decision possible. So this task force will, um, after they are approved on January 24th, begin the process of informing the congregation um, and uh, making the congregation aware of all the latest developments and the relevant issues. One of the things that's very important about what, what is going to happen is that this group will be the ones who are running this. this. So the next time we have a, a town hall, uh, that group will be running it. Um, and in conversation with the SPRC, um, the SPRC has established that my goals that my goals for the coming year is to keep the um, keep the church focused on our mission. So my my primary goal is to keep the senior pastor will focus on God and DMC to accomplish our stated mission to be a harbor of hope in a chaotic world where people come to know God, build meaningful relationships, and unleash compassion. Special emphasis is to be given on centering on concentrating on shared values and mission to help the congregation concentrate on agreed upon goals for ministry, such as worship, outreach, children, ministry, youth ministry, and so forth. I'll also be working to keep our staff focused on our stated mission and ministry. Um, finally, the final goal is to empower the laity as assigned by the administrative board to run the denominational discernment process. Um, I will be a resource to them, but only for what they ask of me. I recognize that I am a conduit back to the institution. There's no way to avoid that. But what we want to establish is that this is a laity decision. This is, and therefore, it is to be a laity-driven process. Um, and that folks, once those folks are elected and appointed, that you will be aware of who they are, and they will be the one, they, they will be your go-to for any questions you may have or any information you may want to share or any information you may need. 
Uh, I will certainly be available to have conversations with people, uh, but, it, but not necessarily just in the realm of information, uh, particularly around the concerns with pastoral care and how this may impact you as, as a person, as a follower of Christ. And so the hope of this meeting is to establish that we are entering into this time of information sharing. We are in, in, entering into a time of discernment and that it will be a lay driven process that I and the staff will resource as needed, but we will not be the ones driving the process. Any questions about that, Aaron? David for specific deadlines. Bishop Carter has not released any specific deadlines as to when he will have a called general or called annual conference in the fall. So we do not have any new information relevant to that. It has been asked for. Gary? It was not. It was done verbally. So what Gary is asking for is that we request the date of the called uh, of the of what basically what what David Christie's promised in his communication that the administrative board write to the DS and request in writing the um, the date when that will be. Is that correct? Well, during the discussion, there was uh, some question in the administrative board with the uh, groups there about how much time the conference would take to process if we decided to disaffiliate. So the purpose of that letter was twofold. One, to thank them for giving us a decision, uh, which they have done, that the bishop would hold a special conference. But secondly, I'll use the word to pin them down on a last date that we could request disaffiliation. So I'd certainly request that that letter be sent. All right, thank you. I have a quick question. I can probably be loud enough. It's harder to hear on that oh, okay. side. It's, it's also helpful for the live stream so that people okay. online can hear. No problem. Um, do we not feel like a vote from the, the laity in October is maybe cutting it too close? that should maybe be moved up to sometime during the summer or? It, it could be. It would be up to that discernment team to set that. Uh, October would probably be the last, the end of the time period. It certainly could be moved up to an earlier time if the, if the team feels that is needed. That was a specific reason to have that letter of thanks to them in a very positive way. Right but also to ask the question, and it'd be a legal document, what is the latest date we can take, make a decision? That was, frankly, I made the motion, and that's why I made it, to try to pin them down to a specific date. Okay. Steve. Oh. With regards to the task force, I was curious where those nominations were coming from. Who was going to elect that? So we did have that conversation at the board. Um, what we there are a couple of ways to the primary way that people come into leadership in the United Methodist Church is through nominations and charge conference election. So what we decided to do was to um, appoint our lay leadership, which primarily is half in Dennis as board chair, lay leader, uh, to nominate people who are already within the existing leadership structure to serve in that role. The goal, and we've, we've had some conversations about this, is to represent the church as a whole. Again, we have a church that is, has a wide variety of opinions over what the best thing to do here is. We have uh, various opinions based on age, 
We have various opinion, opinions based on profession. It's just all over the place. So what we want to do and what we're striving to do is put together a group of people who represent the totality of the church, from um, people who have children to people who are retired, uh, and so that we can people who sing in the choir and come to 815 or people who come to 9 o'clock, people come to 11. We have a we have a lot of different aspects to this congregation, so we're working really hard to make sure that all voices are a part of this. I just want to go back to the comment on the win to take a vote. Um, a church that we're um, still with, but hope to eventually transfer our membership down the year, just disaffiliated. And it took them almost two months to do the paperwork after their vote um, before it could go to the charge conference. So, so there is, and you can find this document at the back as you leave, there is a process that has been established by the annual conference that details the different steps. One of the one of the big considerations is if a church does choose to dis disaffiliate, it creates a whole other decision uh, making process. Uh, if you choose to stay, well, there's really not a lot of decisions to make. If you choose to go, then there are decisions about, one, how do you fund? And, and, and that was presented last time. Um, the last figure we got, and this will be updated, was $540,000 for the price of dis disaffiliation. Uh, that there's a good chance that will go down because it's based largely on pension benefits and liabilities and interest rates, higher interest rates, lower pension liabilities. Um, that that number will be regenerated by the treasurer of the annual conference, but there will be a substantial sum of money that would have to be <laughs> financed. Uh, and then other decisions such as where would you go, how do you find a pastor? Do you join another denomination? Do you become independent? All those are other points of decision that would be um, being acted if disaffiliation was decided upon. And by the and the number for disaffiliation is uh, sixty six point seven percent of I don't know who the point seven person is who votes, but it's sixty six point seven percent or two thirds. Um, is the number it takes for a church to disaffiliate, and the um, those who vote are uh, professing members of the congregation. Uh, just one more comment on the timetable, because I think it, it is very important. Um, I read somewhere, and there is some misinformation out there, but in a correspondence from, I think, uh, the DS, it stated that once a church votes in the church conference, if the vote is to disaffiliate, the annual conference is asking for a minimum of 120 days from the time that vote is taken and read until it can be approved by the annual conference. So we're looking at four months from the time that we make a decision and take a vote so we need to back our schedule from there. I mean, if the, if the call special conference is October, we would need to have the vote no later than June. And, to and, meet I, that. and I don't know the answer to that, Steve. I don't know if that's, if that's a hard and fast rule. Or, and what you'll find, and one of, the, one of the struggles with trying to get your hands around this and your head around this, is that rules vary from annual conference to annual conference. So the rules that are put in place in North Georgia can be different from what they are in Western North Carolina. I, I don't know the answer to that, but that would be something that this group of people would need to figure out very quickly because it would impact then the timeline of the process. Steve, any other comments? Yeah. So that is exactly why the motion was made to send a letter to pin them down so there's no speculation, and we have a definitive date for cutoff. And again, I'd request that, that letter be sent. Uh, I have two questions. One of them is my understanding of the process for initiating the disaffiliation would start with sending a letter to the district superintendent, and he would have then approved 
the plan that the task force would be preparing. Is that correct? I, as best I know, Carrie. Okay. And the second question is, after the task force prepares a plan, I, is it correct that that plan would go back to the administrative board and it would be the administrative board that decides to proceed with this affiliation? Ultimately, it is the, district, the administrative board who decides whether to begin to proceed with this affiliation or not. When, when, does it actually, when does it actually come to a vote of the church members? So that's part of what we're trying to figure out. If, let's say, for instance, if, if what Steve Stevenson has said applies to the Western North Carolina Conference, which personally I don't know if it does or not, it, it would depend on that date and then work its way back. So it could be, again, a vote could be as early as June, or it could be as late as September or, or even October, depending on what the annual conference dictates for their needs. In, in addition to what Gary is recommending, which I strongly support, uh, I think the task force ought to move as quickly as possible. Typically, a discernment process takes a minimum of three months, and then you have another two months, typically, to process through all the other requirements that eventually get to the point where an annual conference would take a vote as to either allow or not allow a disaffiliation. So timing is real critical and we're at the point where we need to move on, on and, putting the plan together. And, and I would make the comment, add to the comment that this is all pertaining to paragraph 2553 which currently is the only means of disaffiliation available to a local congregation. General Conference 20, 2024 may or may not make other provisions. We do not know that. So as of now, the only um, thing in writing is 2553. Uh, but General Conference 2024 may provide or make other pathways. Those are yet to be determined. Um, and the next, the only, the only body that can make decisions for the United Methodist Church is the General Conference, which is scheduled to meet in May in Charlotte, uh, May of 2024. Well, the part of what we wanted to do was it, because of the, the need to move forward with this and not have to call a charge conference to elect leadership was to choose from people who had already been charge, charge conference elected. It doesn't mean that the task force will not and cannot convene listening sessions to hear different, different opinions. It just means that the particular people who will be charged and empowered to run the process will be selected from existing leadership. If the congregation needs some votes and two thirds vote to leave, then that's it. The administrative cannot overturn that, but it can't, which is the administrative is the one. They are the ones who would make the decision to begin the process. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Nancy, would you please repeat that? Sure. Basically, what I was asking is who makes the decision if, if the congregation votes and two-thirds vote to leave, can the administrative group overturn that? No. Uh, the, the, the structure in our church is the generally everything we do is done at, underneath um, the work of an administrative board. We, get, we do, once a year, have an annual charge conference, which is called by the district superintendent, to elect leadership and approve certain things for the coming year. So if you look at various levels of authority, administrative board is one, charge conference is another. This would be a church conference, which is the highest 
form of decision making that a local church can convene. And so once a church conference made this decision, no lesser body, so to speak, could undo it. Hi, I, I would just like to suggest that maybe we move forward with the, obviously the committee, the education, the discernment period, and be a little more proactive in, and maybe look at doing that vote on the earlier side, just in case there's a, a tighter time frame than we're looking at, or in the event that we have the vote and the church votes to stay with the Methodist Church. Then we can put all of that to bed and and, and not be discussing this for right. months on end. Right. Thank um, you. So. No, and, and that's part of why um, part of the, the goal here is to um, is to give this to a group of people that that is their focus. Um, this I I do not want to be, nor do I need to be the one driving this process. Uh, so it, it needs, this group of people will be empowered to pick this up and to uh, begin expediting this as quickly as possible. Uh, Barbara, Lib, uh, And I certainly agree that the ed education process is what we certainly need to go through. Um, can you also please explain what the other main issues are facing the UMC rather than the homosexuality part? Because it seems like that's where we're getting clogged around the axle. But so, there are other issues. So, and, and that's, that's, and some of that is, um, so there, there's concern among some people. And again, part of the difficulty in the UMC is that so much of this exists from conference to conference. That each conference has its, even though we all have the same book of discipline, we all have a different, slightly different conference culture. It's kind of like why you have a different culture at Denver United Methodist versus Fairfield or Bethel or Webb's Chapel or Salem. Uh, and so typically some of the issues, struggles we've had is this idea of what constitutes the core of Christian doctrine, what constitutes the core of uh, Christian practice. And those are, um, and, and in some parts of Methodism, some people are moved, have moved to a very progressive understanding of that. Others are, have adhered to a, a much more conservative view of that. That's part of what the United Methodist Church has struggled with really since 1968 when it became, moved from the Methodist Church to become the United Methodist Church. What the United Methodist Church has tried to do is to hold to the essentials of the faith and leave room for disagreement among other things. And the question then is, do we, are we held together by what we agree on or do we, or, or do we divide on what we disagree on? And that's been an ongoing debate in, in the church for a long time. And that's part of some of the things that uh, hopefully as we go through this educational process, we'll explore. And of course, you can find lots of different opinions out there and lots of different things. Part of the goal of, the, of this group will be to provide the um, accurate information so people can make an informed decision. But there, there are, you know, the, the the presenting issues tend to be human sexuality. The other issues deal with uh, authority of scripture, uh, the role of bishops, the, the role of a general church and general church hierarchy. How do you understand the work and person of Jesus Christ in this world? And those are things that historically have been uh, those are, have been part of the Christian story since the very beginning. If you look and read through Paul's letters, most of Paul's letters are written trying to deal with one dispute or another in a local congregation. First and second Corinthians, which is actually probably five different letters, almost every piece and part of first and second Corinthians deal with this or that of Christian practice and behavior. So it's not new. We're not the first people to ever gather in a Christian church and discuss 
um, differences of opinion, thought, and theology, but just know that that is part of it. Uh, that's part of the larger conversation as well. Those who are seeking to disaffiliate or have, uh, are doing so on, uh, with the concerns that the church has gone too far to the left. Uh, those who, who are seeking to stay often say, well, you know, but can't we, can't we agree on the essentials and leave room for disagreement on certain things? And that's, that often becomes a private and individual decision. So I, I don't, does that answer that? It was a bit of a die trap. Sorry, Marilyn. But there are other, there are larger issues that are cultural issues. And that, again, the United Methodist Church isn't alone in dealing with these. Every congregation, whether they have dealt with them or will deal with them in the future, will deal with issues of understanding of who is Jesus? How do we understand the transcendence of God? How do we, how do we hold to the resurrection? How do we be faithful? Those are questions that have been asked uh, at least for 2,000 years. So we're not alone. Oh, Barbara? Um, I'm confused about taking a vote. Like, what is the process for the decision to make a to make a vote, and who makes the decision? So it would be if we come to the point to take a vote. The it would be a simple ballot, and the ballots that I've seen from other congregations um, are simply: Do you want to stay in the United Methodist Church, or do you wish to disaffiliate? Um, and um, the the ballot, by the way, has to be approved by the DS. Just so, but but the basic the basic way that would happen is those who are members, basically your names on the roll here, uh, and that includes um, our latest confirmation class on up. They would have the ability to vote, and at the end of that day, depending on where the numbers are, would determine whether the church stayed with the United Methodist Church or sought to go in another direction. It would be, and it's only the members of the church who can vote on that. But are we voting or are we not voting? That is, that is up to this, that is up to this task force. That is up. It, it, in all probability, we've gotten this far down the road. All probability, it is yes, there would be a vote. And part of why some some people on the discernment team, and I don't mean to speak just on their behalf, but part of the sentiment behind taking a vote is that it's the only way to know or give people the opportunity to have a say. And then on something this important that it should be the entire congregation who has a say in the outcome. Yeah. Um, is there a reason that right now, that, could we just raise our hand if we wanted to do this again? No. No, it has to be a... Just so that we kind of see where we can be. I know that you know from the cars, but just so everybody can kind of see which direction we're going to be without any of them. Well, and you know that was part of the reason behind the cards, and part of the part of the reason why I don't think that's a good thing to do today is that while we have a good attendance today, we are still not representative of the larger church, and it would really wouldn't give us a whole lot of data because on paper we have eighteen hundred members, uh, and you all know what you know in reality. We probably have anywhere from six to 700 people who are active in the life of this church. Um, and so, so I, I, that's part of what, one of my concerns with a vote is I do not want to create winners and losers. And, but yet that idea that in our system, the only way for true, people to truly be represented is to allow them to have a say. So, Libba? Uh, about the task force, when will it be formed? It, we're in the, it, hopefully by January 24th. It will be formed? Yep. By the 24th? Yep. So it's coming up. 
I say, Marvin. Okay, I just want to bring up another point. We, we've got an important thing to work through here, but there's one factor that we need to be aware of. You know, the ministries of this church are large. I won't even go into how fantastic the ministries are. If we were to uh, call for a vote and have a vote in two months, um, we will lose, uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong when I'm finished, we will lose our pastor in June, no matter what that vote is, because the cabinet meets next month to determine pastors. So if we vote quickly, we'll lose our pastor. And even if that vote turns out that we stay, we've still lost our pastors and we could lose our associates, which could change the whole dynamics of what's going on, no matter which way we go. Yeah, and, and part of what why David wrote the letter was to hopefully get the church to take a deep breath so that that would not happen, so that I could remain appointed here to help be the pastor, not, again, not to influence what you do. I, this, as I've said all along, this is... You all have been here, most of you have been here a long time before I've come, and you'll be here after I go. This, I very much know this needs to be a congregational decision, but I also believe God called me to be your pastor at this time. And I want to help usher this church to, well, regardless of the decision you make, I want to do everything I can to keep us focused on the vast majority of things we agree about, which is serving this community, which is feeding people. I don't know if you guys realize this. You, you heard about the, the young lady who was killed here near Campground Road. Three kids whose mom didn't show up to pick them up from school. Could you imagine those kids going back to that house that their mom had been murdered in? This church paid for a hotel for those kids to be kept in until they can properly be <laughs> counseled, I mean, as best we can, to make sure that they are as good as they possibly can be. And why did this church do that? Well, because the principal at Rock Springs knows the kind of church this is. So he called and said, here's, you know, the situation, can you guys help? And the answer was, of course we can help. Those are the kind of things that hold us together. The service to this community, the people who will, the kids who will eat dinner tomorrow night because, uh, or tonight because they had backpack over the weekend. Those are the things I don't, I, that's what I see my role in this. I want you all to run this process. I want it to be, certainly to be fair. I want it to be, uh, I want everybody to feel like they've had a chance to have their say. But I want us to stay focused on the work of Christ in this community. Uh, and, uh, and make sure that the enormous good this church does, does not diminish. So that's part of why I was relieved when David sent that note saying the bishop will and again you can get all we'll get all the guarantees and assurances but I, I certainly believe I'm called to be your pastor at such a time as this and and I know that my own personal plans to stay with the United Methodist Church it that's a disappointment to some I get that but I, I hope you'll respect that how, that's where I feel called to be. That doesn't mean I'm not going to help you get where you feel called to be. No, no. Well, no, if you were, if, 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 the, if the board had a move to take a vote this spring then the bishop would have had, they would have reappointed me. Okay. But that did not happen. So it is not correct that however we vote, we lose you either. No, if, if you wait to the fall and the church voted to not disaffiliate, then I would remain your pastor. But if the church moved to a vote, let's say March 1st, and began the process today, they would reappoint me somewhere else. Harold? 
the the two thirds figure that you talked about is that based on the people that are present at the vote or sixteen hundred or no, six hundred or it's based on the people who show up that day. If if ten show up, then two thirds of ten. If three hundred show up, so that it's based on the number of it's based on the it's based on the number of ballots cast. Some. Oh, Bradley. Hi. Um, going back to Marvin's point and then kind of what we've been kind of chatting a little bit about, can you speak to what, how, if you vote to to, to leave, to leave, um, what that looks like for the staff, not just for you, but the other staff, because I know where I go to church, we have a large staff where some, some of our ministers are appointed by the conference, but others are hired as if in, they were applying any other business. So how would that affect not only the staff, but also your role and also going to Marvin's point, that timeline, depending on when you decide to do this vote? Um, well, the, the staff of the church outside of, of me um, and now Ben and David, so the three of us are considered under appointment. Uh, ben and David would have their own decisions to make about where they feel God is calling them. Uh, and the rest of the staff is, is hired by the church. So that would be up, I mean, and again, each individual staff person makes their own decisions about how long, often how long they would like to be here or how long they wouldn't like to be here. But it, the, the primary staff it would involve would be certainly be me, Ben, and David, with each of us making our own decisions based upon where God's calling us to be. Can I ask you? Yep. Um, this is kind of on the same general lines, but what about membership? So if you are a member now of the United Methodist Church and the church decides to leave and is no longer part of the United Methodist Church, but you want to keep your membership in the United Methodist Church and leave, is that a simple process for you to move your membership so or from how does I, your, this affect your membership? No, well, from what I understand, let's say if you are a part of this church the two thirds of the church voted to disaffiliate, but you did not want to disaffiliate personally from the United Methodist Church, that there is a provision that they're working out to where your membership would reside in the annual conference until it could be transferred to another United Methodist Church. So you're, you would remain a member of the United Methodist Church until you can connect with an existing United Methodist Church. Gary, uh, don't want to dominate, and I hope you stay. Uh, two or three things. I'm gonna ramble a little bit. I think one other thing. I don't know how many people are aware of the in the administrative board that our uh, finance committee took a position on bishops by deciding exactly what our apportionment to the conference would pay for, and it would not pay for bishops. Uh, and I think that was a very strong stance, and I applaud the uh, Finance Committee for that recommendation. Uh, secondly, uh, as far as the timing of the vote, I would, well, a couple of things, and again, I said I'm going to ramble. I would hope that the task force would come up with a method that those are, that are not present can also vote. For instance, shut-ins. Uh, so that we have ballots and our entire membership can have a chance to vote. Whether that can be done in one day or not, I don't know. But I certainly would hope the task force would do that. I, well, I don't know the answer. Uh, just let me get to that one, Gary. That, that would be determined by the rules that apply to paragraph 2553. So those, that, that would, we just have to figure out what those are. Well, I, I, I have the pleasure, it's not always a pleasure, of serving on the district trustees and working with David Christie at some of these churches that are going through this process. And I can assure you that the executive committee of the conference has been very willing to, I don't want to say bend the rules, but assist churches in this and not be overbearing. For instance, uh, we are actually allowing churches to sell their parsonages to meet the financial obligation of disaffiliation, which is 
kind of against the rules, but the executive committee of the conference decided to help. So I think they'd probably allow a bending of the rules for the full congregation to vote. I also would ask the task force to invite other denominations that we might want to consider joining in to educate us. And the final thing I'd ask everybody to do is to read the discipline. I was cut off, caught off guard in one of the meetings that I had to uh, handle for David and was asked the position of the Methodist Church. And I wrongly stated it. And I told that group if I was wrong, I would come back to them, and I did. And I had to read the discipline again to find out the position. Those of you that have not done that, please take time to read the social principles of the United Methodist Church, which would also give you information on what you're voting on. Thank you. Jonathan. Uh, Jonathan Strike. I'm, I'm not a member of the church. Uh, we've been visiting here and we love love uh, Steve and and uh, David and and Carol and Ben uh, and we love what this church is doing and what it, it represents uh, you mentioned well the, the main point I wanted to make was that uh, you wanted you you said that you want the task force to represent the whole church um, and I think that's that's fine. I, I just ask that the administrative board or, or the discerning committee, whoever chooses those people, that you choose people who are strong believers. There are a lot of nominal Christians in the church. Um, I, I wanted to say also that the, the primary decision making here should be with respect to God's church here in Denver. I know we, we love Steve and we love uh, our, our staff, but that, you know, they're going to come and go. So the decision needs to be basically about, you know, what the church of God is going to look like here in this sanctuary. That's the primary decision making. Uh, it's, it's water over the dam. But Christianity isn't something that we vote on. It's not a democratic uh, institution. It's one that is ordained by God. And the people who made the decisions in the church conferences uh, were not the church laity. They were the church elders. And, uh, and that's, well, that's all I want to say is, is thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you for being a part of what we're doing here. Hi, I'm Carl Sarnes. I've been here 44 years plus. The Episcopal Paleon churches in South Carolina have locked their doors already. It'd be real good if these people in uh, the conference will pull their self back out and to keep from having this mess we got into and all the churches up and down their street have left other churches because of this stuff and it'd be easier if they left out and you got conference meeting in June mm -hmm. is all the churches going to be there that's left and, and ones that's not made a decision yet so if uh if a church has, there will be a slate of churches who will be voted on at annual conference who've, who, who will have completed their work for disaffiliation. So, uh, and, there, and any church that's already disaffiliated, of course, will not be there. Okay. And then he said we had four months. And you come back from conference in June, you should have a meeting sometime in the next couple of months after you get back from conference in June before the four months ends up in December. Something like that. Yeah. Uh, other comment, this is the devil at work, and he's doing a real good job of tearing all the churches up. Uh, I, I think we can all agree on that. Uh, I was ordained under the Book of Discipline, the 1992 edition. And I chose to be United Methodist Church. 
I, I, I took vows to support the United Methodist Church. And it, it, it troubles me that we're at this point because, um, again, we all knew what we were getting into when we joined. But also understand that the work of God in this world is <laughs> sometimes it breaks stuff. I, I don't know how to explain. We'll get into more of that later. But I just pray, and I know this is the, that we can hold together because, folks, I, you have an amazing thing going on here. You have people who genuinely love each other, who care for each other, who honestly want to make this world a better place, who are earnestly striving to follow Jesus Christ as Lord. And Jesus talks a lot about you decide what something is by what it produces. And he asks over and over again, show me the fruit and I'll tell you what kind of tree it is. That what God has, is and has done in this place, we have to be on guard to not allow that to be disrupted and corrupted. Because you're exactly right, Carlton. This is a this is a big win for for evil. It's a big win for Satan. It's a big win for all that would oppose the work of Jesus Christ in this world. That we're in here talking about this today instead of talking about how to make disciples. So my goal is to keep us focused on making disciples. Uh, again, you all, this is your church. And Jonathan's exactly right. It is, uh, you know, I've been here. I'm in my um, seventh year. It's hard for me to believe. Uh, even if I stayed all the way to retirement, that's only six more months. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean. I don't, I, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but even if I stayed all the way for 12 more years till I'm 65 years old, that's not long in the life of a church. You all are the church of Jesus Christ. You all have to be empowered to decide and be clear about what this church is. My hope and prayer and here, here is that it, this probably will come to a vote. I think it's certainly moving in that direction. And when that happens, what happens when someone, there will be someone who doesn't, who, who ends up on the opposite side. There will be someone who votes to stay. There'll be someone who votes to leave. Do we, does that mean, regardless of what the outcome of the vote is, is that this church blows up? It doesn't have to. Because regardless of what anyone in a general conference meeting, or anyone in a Charlotte of office, a Charlotte office may decide. Re regardless, when this church opens its doors the next day, it's going to be the same church, and I pray it'll have the same people, and the same energy, and the same spirit. Because you all, in the local body are the church and bureaucrats and um, you know, it, it's no mistake, it's not surprising that the only people Jesus had real trouble with were the, were the scribes and the Pharisees, the temple officers, the head honchos. That's, so who did he come to? Jesus is much more on the side of the people in the pews and that's who, that's who this is. This is who it's about. Um, sorry. I... When we vote, if we vote, there's no venue large enough for this church. Do we vote during services? Most likely. Um, it would be a process, and, and, it, and it varies, uh, and different conferences have done it differently. But it, would, it could look a lot like, just like when you vote um, at East Lincoln or 
Rock Springs that you come in, you sign in, you get your ballot with your name on it, you, you vote, you turn it in, and then those are counted at the end of several hours, not in one fell swoop. But it would have to be, the voting process would have to be established to be fair to all who wish to participate. And it wouldn't be just gathering and raising your hands. So. I'd like to go back to something you said early on about um, the DS documents that are out in the hallway. One of them that he left is straight off the Western North Carolina Conference website. And it does detail the process there. Uh, so what, what the task force would be, uh, as I see it, would be tasked with is taking, starting with what has been identified by the conference and customizing it to some extent for our situation, including the disaffiliation process. So uh, anybody that wants to have a better understanding, a more detailed understanding of the process, there is a document out there that explains all that. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. And all those are out on a holder out there. I think Tom or Steve. Uh, thanks, David. Uh, I'm Steve Wisnett, my wife, Marilyn. We've been members here as long as Steve has, seven <laughs> years. We came from Davidson here. Um, but I just got a few things to say about the process for me personally. Uh, as I've been educated about what this is all about, I've seen things I don't like about Methodist Church. I've been a Methodist, a member of a Methodist Church for 71 years. I can't imagine what it'd be like waking up one day and not be a member of a United Methodist Church. But I don't like some of the things I see. And I'm not one to run up and fight. Um, I'm an engineer financial guy, so I've still looked at the budget that, that our money goes to every year and our apportionments go. Uh, ministerial Education Fund, 25.8 million. That's for our seminaries, which have not much guidance and counsel and, and accountability. They're, they're kind of getting out on, on that far end. Episcopal Fund, that pays our bishops. Those guys make $175,000 a year, plus housing, plus benefits. The uh, Interdenominational Cooperation Fund, $2 million, to councils of churches worldwide and national. Black College Fund, $10.3 million. African University Fund, two point three. General Administrative uh, Fund, $9 million. World Service Fund, the, that has a good ring to it. World Service, $76.5 million, but I found no missionary work in any of that. It's all just salaries of administrative people. That's about $150 million goes to these this admin overhead structure. Um, that's not a good business model, in my opinion. There's a lot of overhead, so, so to speak. Um, and, and, but I like what I heard earlier, and I like what you said, Steve, about a culture of a church. I think the decision we need is not to vote, not the vote we're thinking to vote at, but to vote to think what, what is this church really is. What are we as a body? Are we a traditional church uh, that we believe in the Bible, or are we a church that says, whatever's okay, you rewrite the Bible, tell us what you want us to do today, let our cultural come in and just change everything. Which, which kind of church do we want to be? And we can still be United Methodist Church. I just heard we can, we can tell we don't want to pay this particular fund, and we, we strike it out. I can also say if a, if a bishop sends us Reverend Pente, uh, Pentecost to replace Steve, we say, heck no, we don't want somebody like that. Take him back and send us somebody that fits our culture. I don't know how long that might last in the Methodist church. I don't know if that's even doable. But to me, it says, let's determine what kind of church we are and stand behind that and fight for that, whether it be a Methodist or whatever it might be. But... Um, I think that's what the real question here it needs to be. And, and a lot of stuff I see, I don't, I don't it, like it. It is. Sure. And, and I, you won't get any argument from me. Part of why I feel called to stay United Methodist is to be part of some changes. And some of those changes are that this, we are, we are upside down. The, the larger body has, it's a lot like the United States government. How many of you all feel like you're represented by, well by the United States government, or do we exist to support them? And, and there, there's a lot to that. Um, there's a lot of, uh, and my prayer is that the United Methodist Church doesn't waste a crisis 
and makes the needed reforms. As Gary mentioned, we have, uh, because of concerns expressed to us from members of our congregation, because of actions of specific bishops, said we don't want to support bishops. Um, we've also said we, the administrative fund that is largely bishops. Those are other decisions that as we go along and have conversations, we make, may make other decisions. For our part, uh, about $30,000 a year goes to the general church out of our particular budget. But we have say in how that, what we can do with that, and we're beginning to exercise that. Uh, so just know that there are people paying attention to that, and there are people who care about that. I just wanted to say something um, to speak to what the gentleman just spoke about. I've loved Jesus since I was five years old. I chose him when I was five years old. I didn't choose being a Methodist or a Baptist or whatever. I chose him. And I hear a lot of talk about the Book of Discipline and a lot of talk about being a Methodist. But I think ultimately it comes down to what God has said and what he says in the Scripture. And I think we have to look at the Scripture. It's not gray like a lot of people want to say it is. It is black and white. And it speaks to the things that we're talking about. And some of the things that they're trying to incorporate take away from the scripture. We recited the Apostles' Creed at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And in that Apostles' Creed, it says that I believe in God the, Father, God the Father, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, in the virgin birth. And it says other different things. And I've heard, I don't know this is true, but I've heard they're trying to take away the very foundations of what we believe in the Scripture. Even to the point of the virgin birth. So, I think we have to think about what's in the Bible. So, so the restrictive rules of the United Methodist Church will never be changed. And those are available in, in that book of discipline. But the idea of Scripture is primary. It is the basis upon which we move and operate. It is God's primary revelation to us. Each generation has had to reckon with what Scripture means and how we understand Scripture to be lived out in practice. There's some of that going on here. And when I hear some people say, well, they've changed the Bible. Well, no, no one's changed the Bible. Uh, and they have, but, but we do have, there, there are places where people, people who love Jesus, who love Scripture, honestly disagree. And it's very hard for people to believe that someone could love Jesus and disagree with them on some things. What, what's frustrating to me as a pastor is the things that we agree on is, is overwhelming. It's overwhelming. And there have been times in the life of the church where people have struggled in ways with to reckon with Scripture. This church was founded in 1884 as a Methodist Episcopal Church South. Yeah, any idea what anybody knows what that means? That means the church split north and south because the Methodists in the South believed that Scripture said it's okay to own slaves. Fought a war over it. So I'm just saying there are places. I grew up in a church, in a tradition that that took the Bible and beat the living daylights out of you with it. I didn't know God loved me. I thought God was trying to catch me doing something wrong so that I could be consigned to the depths of hell. I, I, that's a particular scriptural interpretation that I personally didn't agree with. 
There is a way to faithfully hold on to each other, to understand Scripture, to interpret Scripture. And I don't care who you are, you're going to interpret Scripture based on the lens through which you look, based on where you were born, based on how you think, based on where you went to school. Uh, I remember having a conversation with my brother, who's a diehard, independent missionary Baptist, and he was ranting and raving about people drinking beer. And I, I asked him, I said, so if you grew up in Germany and beer was just part of your culture, what would you do? Well, they're, well they've all got to be going to hell. I'm just saying, again, I don't want to... I don't want to sound condescending. What I want to do is lift up that people of good faith, people of integrity and love and compassion, that there are places where we're not going to agree on everything. One of the reasons I chose to become a United Methodist Church is because it was that type of church. One of the things I loved about First United Methodist Norwood was on Sunday morning, um, Frank Lee, who was one of the biggest farmers in South Stanley County, self-professed, most liberal person he knows, who listened to uh, NPR every day while he rode his combine, right, sat next to Chester Loudermilk, who was chair of the Republican Party for Stanley County. And they sang in the choir together. And they had broke bread together. If we want to talk about what our culture is doing to us, our culture is breaking us into those who watch Fox News and those who watch MSNBC. It's telling us that if you vote this way or you vote that way, you can't be in relationship with each other. It's telling us our primary identity is a worldview that is not Christian. The parts of the Bible that we have to agree on is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus does not give us love as an option. He says, this is my commandment to you, that you will love one another. And it's not always easy for us to love each other. Believe it or not, there are days where I'm unlovable. And some of you are easier to love than others. And the reason I'm offering that out there is that I think there's an antidote to this impasse. And that antidote has a name, and that name is Jesus Christ. And some of this gets almost down to middle school. Like, well, I can't go down to the hardware store because somebody heard I went to United Methodist Church. They're going to think I'm a liberal. Well, it's not middle school. Why do you care what your neighbors think about you if you're following Jesus? Are we willing to risk radical love for people? I'm not advocating for changes in standards. I'm not advocating we do anything different today than we did yesterday or the day before. I'm just asking, can we hold on to God and love and what Jesus teaches and if we want to get down to parsing out scripture, we can eventually parse ourselves into smaller and smaller communities until we're all out there agreeing with, only, with an audience of one, which would be ourself. So I know, you, you know how I feel. I've been, as, as, I've been straight up with you. I, I believe I'm called to stay in the United Methodist Church for these reasons, because I, I like being a part of a larger body that doesn't always agree about every little thing. And there's work to do in the United Methodist Church. There's a ton of things to reform. But from my point of view, I think my voice matters in that denomination. I do want you all, without a doubt, to do what you need to do to be clear about who you are. And as long as that's following Jesus, you're gonna be okay. And we're all going to be okay. As we go through this discernment time, as this team runs this, please pray for each other. 
Uh, something else Jesus tells us to do. Pray for those who don't agree with you and maybe even seek out conversations with people you know may not agree with you. You might be surprised. You might be surprised at who may not align with you on everything, on every matter of belief. I believe God can shape us in incredible ways. This is a time of wilderness. This is a time of testing. What are we going to learn? Um, I pray that it's that we learn how to be better followers of Jesus. Can I come up here and oh. preach a little? <laughs> <laughs> I'm John Walker. Uh, we've been in this church for less than six months, and um, we're lifelong Methodists, but I'm not sure we're members here yet, so I better join up so I can vote. Uh, Vicki over here, um, we have been very impressed with the church here, with the love, the compassion, the service that y'all have done, and we don't want to mess up a good thing. Um, our, when you think about it, we can have compassion with conviction. We can have compassion for homosexuals, compassion for bisexuals, compassion for the handicapped, compassion for the physically fit, compassion for the ignorant, compassion for the brilliant. We can have compassion for everybody if we have conviction in the scripture. We can have both. Now, I don't believe in running away from anything. I believe in standing and making changes in our own denomination. If we run away we are being cowards. We can continue in this church to be loving, to be kind, to be compassionate, and to stay United Methodist with the basic beliefs that the Methodists have. So I would plead for you to have courage of your convictions and to have compassion and also conviction in the scripture. And I think uh, Yogi Berra, that great philosopher, <laughs> Yogi Berra said it best. When you find a fork in the road, don't take it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> uh, you sure you want to follow that, Tom? <laughs> I, I don't know if I should follow that or not. <laughs> Tom Wallace here, and I have one request and then one question. The one request is, um, first of all, would you all please look around at everybody around you and notice how many of us have gray hair, okay? <laughs> so I really encourage the task force to make sure that either we have representatives of the, some of the younger folks or at least listen to them. And, and have their voice be a part of this. If for nothing else, when it comes time to vote, if we vote, I want to make sure that they're here too uh, so, they, so they can participate because they are, sad to say, in 50 years, they're the future of this particular church and we need to have them involved. I know they are involved, but I want to make sure we go out of our way to make them involved. Yep. Second, second one, this is um, a question. Um, when I think about if we come to a vote, the decision process, every one of us makes a decision in a different way and has different values on different things. Some people, honestly, are going to say $542,000? No way. Some people are going to say, are we going to lose Steve? No way. But all of us will have all these factors in our mind trying to make the decision. The one that I would like to, to ask about, though, is... Some of us do well studying scripture by ourselves, and some do well studying scripture as a group. And I'm wondering if we still have a plan or if we can do something for those who would like to study the scripture, 
bounce ideas back and forth between uh, fellow fellow people uh, on the scripture about this particular issue. Uh, is there anything we can do to help there? Well, thanks for asking, Tom. Um, yeah, the, so starting in February, my, my, my goal, uh, my plan is to offer a study. I want to do it on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock and then offer it again during the day on Thursday to give everybody a chance to be a part of the conversation. Um, and the way it's going to work is we're going to, we're going to begin by looking at how we talk about the Bible. We're going to talk about how we interpret Scripture. We will eventually get to those specific texts. But one thing I want to it, essentially, and I think Steve Stevenson used this big word last time. I had to look it up. It's hermeneutics. Um, how do you interpret and understand Scripture? And so that will be a big part of that focus. Uh, again, how do you how do you read Leviticus? How do you read Genesis? How do you read the book of Psalms? Anyone ever tried to read the wisdom of Solomon? Anybody ever wondered why Genesis says there were giants? There's all kinds of things in the Bible that some of them are, are clear. Some of them, <laughs> they take a lot of, of sorting out. So, yeah, there is. So that, that's coming. We'll hear more about that. John? I'm not exactly bat, batting clean up here, but I do would like to follow up on a couple of things that were said. There's no doubt where I stand in this. I've stood up many times and said I favor staying with the Methodist Church. I took the time between the last time I said this and this time to go out and talk to a lot of people as I did volunteer work. And I'm proud to say that I would talk about the elephant in the room because we weren't concentrating on that. And most of them had sharp objects in their hand and not once did anyone throw one at me. <laughs> but in these conversations, I heard the same thing Steve mentioned. I heard there is a fear or an anger over our attitudes towards homosexuality. I heard that there's anger and fear over a top heavy government of the church and how it's being used. I heard that there's anger and fear over attempts to change the scripture and thus change the book of discipline. There's also two other groups, and one of them has been mentioned. And that's a group of young people that are rather ambivalent about the whole process of, of some of the things that, that we're angry about and don't know enough about it. And we need to, we need to include them. There is another group, a group that loves God's place, loves this church, that have memories of some of the best times in their lives and some of the most crucial supportive times in their lives. They have loved ones buried up here. They are in anguish because they don't know where they're going to go, except they want to follow the place. I feel a little bit like the cowboy when I walked in the room and the stampede has started. I've heard people say, we need to disaffiliate. I ask and plead with you, do more than just say disaffiliate. Tell me where you're going. Tell these people I mentioned where you're going. Are you going to join another denomination? Are you going to be a standalone church? One thing I do know is that the United States government was founded on a revolution, but that revolution had a basis, and that basis was they were prepared. They had leadership in place. They wrote a declaration of independence, and they had France pumping the money into it, and we succeeded in leaving. But if you have a revolution where you just say we're leaving and then we'll decide what we're going to do, one, you're going to miss out on some votes, and two, your, your opportunity for making it is greatly diminished because you don't have that organization set up. And finally, I want to, I want to say this. A few weeks ago, I put up my nativity scene. 
I have loved that aspect of Christmas more than any other. But this year when I put up that nativity scene, I, spayed, I, I, I looked at these different objects that I picked up. Jesus was born into a community of diversity. Think about it. You had the common man, the shepherd, not just shepherds, third shift shepherds. I mean people who worked all night. I grew up in a, a mill community, so I know what third shift is, the graveyard shift. They had rich people, educated people there. The three wise men, the three kings. They even had a representative from the heavenly host in my, in my nativity because there's an angel there. Of course, there's some animals. And then you have a teenage girl who for all practical purposes in the community was pre impregnated and an older uh, earthly father who had every right to take his Bible and have her stoned, killed, because she was having a child out of wedlock. Now that's what Jesus was born into. Later on, he goes out and he starts forming his own community. And that community included, first of all, about 12 years old, a bar mitzvah time, the members of the church, the, the key leaders of the church. And he discussed things with them. And his parents came and said, what are you doing over here? You should have been home with us. Later, he picks his disciples. Who does he go for? Diversity. He went first for the fishermen. But not only fishermen, they were people who were part of a family business. Because some of them said, well, let me go back and help Dad get this together before I go. And they said, no. He said, come on. Government employee, tax collector, a zealot, and a thief. And from that, he built God's church. If you think a little bit further, Paul, who we are claiming says this about this and this about that, he was a one-man denomination. He organized churches. He wrote to churches. He told churches to support one another. And from a little community, the whole world was built. Now, I'm much too long with it because I'm sorry I'm on the roll. The, the, the thing that I have thought about more than anything else is staying in the denomination because we can do so much more than we can as an independent church. We can do so much more than we would if we go out somewhere else. I'm Presbyterian by birth. <laughs> we went through this some years ago. I think you're bad too. <laughs> <laughs> could be, could be. <laughs> My son certainly is. I do know this. You're going to need the young people to go along with you. And you're also going to need to know where you're going. So why don't you stay? John, is that your name? Right. Yeah. Well, I need to well, we got, we, one thing. Okay. <laughs> one, one thing. About John. John, what John is trying to say is we don't know what kind of mess we're going to go into if we disaffiliate. We don't know what's going to happen. So we're better to stay here with this good group of people than to disaffiliate into something we don't know what's happening. All right, thank you. Doug, and then Bruce. Doug. Anybody else? Go. Okay. Go. <laughs> All right, my name is Doug Norwood. Um, I've been a Methodist since 1974 when Donna agreed to marry me. Um, I was a Southern Baptist before that, and uh, you know how Southern Baptists are. We thought we was the only ones going to heaven. But anyway, uh, it was, I was a very, I felt like as a teenager, I was very, I 
not, I won't say devout, but I was very into the church and into Christianity. And so when I became a Methodist, I asked the minister at Donna's church, I said, what is a Methodist? He gave me, and still got it, a book of discipline. He said, this is like the Torah for the Methodist church. Hey, so I read it. I said, that's some pretty good stuff in there. I think I'll become a Methodist. Okay, so with that said, let me say something about Pastor Steve. There's a lot of people that are preachers. He's a pastor. And I mean that. He is a, one of the finest people I know. And I really hate your having to do this. And your staff, you got a good staff. The staff works hard. Um, anyway, where I'm going with this is the Torah of the Methodist Church, the book of discipline, right? What's happened? It's almost become the book of undiscipline in some areas. You know, there are violations of what the book of discipline is, and there are no consequences. Now, as long as we have Steve here, and he brought it up, he's not going to be here forever. As long as we have a current DS, and he's not going to be here forever. The bishop, he's not going to be here forever. What's going to stop the next people from putting, what's, what's its name, it, her, him, whatever it is, Penny Cost in the pulpit? Nothing. Just something to think about. Because right now the book of discipline is being trout in the mud in other places not here but it's it's possible that this could happen in the future uh, I would I would like to point out one thing this is kind of is a tag on to what John free said uh, one of the tasks of the task force is to uh, go through a process of determining w what would be possible for our church if the vote is to disaffiliate. I think that's part of what uh, Pastor Steve read that the advisory group came forth and submitted to the administrative board. So the, the concern about where do you go after disaffiliation I think is valid, but it's a very difficult question to ask, and the task force would be uh, taking on that responsibility. Hi. This is probably one of the hardest things I've ever been through. I've been through cancer, I've been through war, and this has really torn me up, what our church is going through right now. I've listened to both sides of this. I am part of a, a group that has been studying this. This man right over here has been studying it for five years. I want to know, how many people have an idea of what happens if we disaffiliate? How many know what happens? Very few of you, because you don't know. You don't have the information. We went to the board as a group, and we wanted three things, to seek a broader understanding of the issues by providing information to the people so they could make an informed decision about what's taking place in our church today. During the process, we'd like to see the church enter into a time of prayer and discernment that we might seek the Holy Spirit and his guidance in where we go and where we end up. And third, we wanted to move forward with the goal of bringing this to a vote and let the congregation decide as an informed body of what we want to be. Now, I've listened to people tell me that if we leave the Methodist Church, what are we going to do? We're going to be, Hap is still going to be the head of the board. Our board is still going to be intact. Every committee that we have in the church will still be the same committee in our church. Nothing changes there. 
This church is the people in it. We're the bricks, not this building. We're the bricks, each one of us that built this church over a period of time. I've been here over 25 years, and I feel like a rookie. I have friends that have been here, and their families have been here, and their grandparents before them. This is our church, not the United Methodist. They don't own this church. They think they own the buildings. They... What happens if we disaffiliate? What happens? Nothing. We keep the same missions that we carry out now. We still go to the Henderson Settlement and make a difference in the Appalachian Mountains. Nothing changes there. What changes? One, we can finally own this building that we paid for and built. And the people before us paid for and built. It'll be ours. Right now it's not. You say, well, we won't have any direction. Yes, we will. I've got a book that says Holy Bible on it that gives us all the direction that we will ever need. We're level-headed, thinking people. We can put together an organization here that can beat any other Methodist church on the block. Look at the independent churches around you. Their parking lots are full. We're part of a broad organization in the Methodist Church. A big part of that Methodist Church is Africa. Anybody know anything about the African continent and the Methodist Church there? They're huge. They're the reason right now that our church hasn't already been changed and liberalized to the point where we have no control at all. They're holding it together. They put out a statement that says they're getting tired of this. We have bishops that are corrupt. We have a hierarchy that doesn't answer to the people. They dictate. Nobody has any accountability at the bishop level. They just appointed 13 new bishops. Did you know that? In the Methodist Church. Every one of them are liberal bishops. Two of them are same-sex marriages. Now, I have nothing. That's their, their thing. But I think it, the book of discipline that we live by is being violated on a daily basis. And we've been told that it'll continue to be violated no matter how the boat goes down. So disaffiliation, what does that mean? It means we're no longer a part of the Methodist Church. And I would say, and we would put a, together a group of people smarter than me, I hope, that we stay independent for a year to decide who and what we want to be. And there are options. There's the Evangelical Methodist Church. There's the Global Methodist Church. We can be independent and still use the Book of Discipline as one of our guidelines. Disaffiliation doesn't mean that we leave the church physically, move out. This is our church. We stay here. And those that don't like the way it goes as a conservative movement... There's plenty of liberal churches around. Now, are we the first ones to do this? No. Before it's over with, there'll be over 5,000 churches gone from the Methodist church. There's a reason for this problem that we're facing. And the reason is people have violated the word of God. The leaders of this church have violated the word of God. And it's up to us as this church to take it back. To make a difference. So disaffiliation. That doesn't mean we're floating out there. In the middle of nowhere with no direction. We have plenty of direction right here in this church. That's, why do you think we're a great church right now? Look at, you, look at the guy next to you. Look at the woman next to you. That's the reason we're a great church. Being affiliated with a Methodist church doesn't get us anything. It takes from us things. Now, Steve, I love you. And I know we're, we love each other. And we're called to love one another. But if I'm not mistaken. The Bible that I have, I know a Jesus that walked into a church, made a whip, and cleaned the place out. He was mad because they desecrated his church. And I'm mad because the Methodist church has become corrupt. This is our opportunity.
Some say God will make a way. I believe he has. And it's up to us. God gave us arms, legs, hands to, to move and do. He made a way for us to break away from a church that is going further and further to the liberal side. And if you're liberal, I'm not, I got no problem with you. But you're not taking my church there. I can show you, and we will in the future, share with people what's really taking place in the Methodist church that you're not told about. So, when we talk about disaffiliation, let's not talk about being a lost church. Let's talk about taking control of who we are and where we want to go. And I don't, I don't want to take up much more of your time, but I will. <laughs> um, there is a future here for becoming one of the greatest churches in the state of North Carolina. Right down the road is a new church. This morning there was a traffic jam. You couldn't get in the parking lot. You couldn't get in there. That many people are being drawn to that church. Why do you think that is? Because they're preaching the word of God and the politics are out. They don't have bishops telling them what they will and will not do. Every independent church up and down the highway is thriving. Other churches have gone through this. The Presbyterian church went through it years ago. And look at them today. They're nothing but a, a skeleton of what they used to be. And they're continuing to lose people. And it's a dying denomination. The Methodist church is bleeding members now. And it'll continue to do so as long as it trends in the same direction as the Presbyterian church and the other churches that have gone this way. I want you to be informed. We should have more gatherings to where we give you information, not just, we can all talk about our feelings. I got feelings, you got feelings, and I want to sound really coarse here, but I don't care about your feelings. <laughs> and I know you don't care about mine. I want to know what you think. I want to know what you know and what you believe. That's what's important. That's what makes a church. Feelings don't. Feelings come and go. They change with the wind. We've got to be a Bible-believing church and continue to go in that direction. And the only way we can really do it is on our own. We're grown-ups. We can, we can drive this boat. We can make it happen. Don't be afraid to talk about disaffiliation. All of you have got a lot of questions that need to be answered, but unless you know what's going on, you don't know what to ask. How do you ask a question about the atomic bomb if you know nothing about how it's built? So you need information, and this committee that we asked to, be, to come together and, and do something, we're going to be leaning on them to do it, and, and we're offering all the support that we have, and we have a group that is very knowledgeable. This man right here is a, a, a encyclopedia of knowledge. Now, we've been talking all night about how we get out, the process. Here's the process right here. It'll, it'll fall into place. If we decide we want to be our own church, we do that first, then all this falls into place. We go down the list and we do what we must do to disaffiliate. So the process isn't what we need to be discussing. It's who we are, who we want to become, and what we really believe. Now don't take it from me. Talk to people. Talk to people in this church that know and have studied this issue. And get the answers that you really need. I'm going to propose to, that we allow, be allowed to give on Sunday after church free barbecue and a class over there every Sunday giving you more and more information as to what's going on. And uh, so that, that hopefully will come in the future and keep your ears and eyes open and your heart open to what God is leading us to do. And don't blow it off thinking we can't because we can't. Beth? Um, I just wanted to get some clarity to the criteria for the vote. Because I've been hearing if we vote, I've actually heard don't have to take a vote. Just wanted to know the criteria for. 
it would be um, an established church conference would be called. Members of the church would vote, and it would come down to a very simple proposition. Do you wish to stay with the United Methodist Church, or do you wish to leave? But, I mean, How do we get there? Yeah, I was told when David Christie was asked if the church had to vote. Yes. If you don't vote on anything, you automatically stay with the United Methodist Church. Now, that would be... That would be if, you know, this committee working with the administrative board brings this proposal to move forward with a vote on disaffiliation, then that would trigger the voting process. And it, as you can tell from being here tonight, thank you for your patience for starting in the afternoon and in, ending in the evening. Um, if nothing else, we, we've proven to each other we can hang with it for a couple hours. We're in very different, there are people all over the place on this. So it, it almost certainly will, you know, most, I mean, I, I, I can't speak for the committee or for the administrative board, but it, it's almost certain to come to that point where the congregation does weigh in with their opinion through a voting process. I, I don't, we can talk offline if, if, if that's not clarifying enough. Aaron? Oh, wait. Um, I may have heard incorrectly, but it, uh, it, it seems like I heard somebody say we need to stay with the United Methodist Church because we know what's going on here and we don't know what's out there. This is the safe move. And I was, the first thought that came to my mind was I can't come up with a single place in scripture where God says, play it safe. He asks us all the time to take that step out in faith, whether it's to stay with the United Methodist Church or to disaffiliate, we need to be listening to him. Yeah, thank you. Aaron, thank you. Steve, so this is going to be um, a question directed at you. So you can chastise me later. <laughs> um, <clears throat> you have said you, you're leaving it to the congregation and you're not here to influence us, but you do influence yes. us everything you say or do. Um, so you do that. You're the leader of the church. I know you are, the task force is going to drive this. Um, when you do this Bible study, I think that Tom was asking about, are we going to do that? Are you going to be the leader of that and state you're our pastor what you firmly believe the scripture says? Yes. Okay. It's not going to be a discussion of there are all these sides and, and I'm not going to give you my no, statement of where I am on this topic. There'll definitely be the, we'll definitely look at the opposing points of view, but I'm not afraid to tell you what I feel. On the okay, topic. so as the leader of the church, you're going to tell us where you firmly stand. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how I understand the scripture. Okay. And, and the reason and, I say that is um, Bruce was talking about independent churches up and down. Um, our daughter goes to an independent church, um, Summit Church, which is J.D. Greer, a huge church. You can't get in there on Sunday. It's an um, um, independent church, and when you walk in the door, you know exactly where J.D. Greer stands. I mean, there's no, no doubt about it. Uh, in Leesburg, Virginia, uh, Cornerstone, Pastor Gary up there. Uh, you can't get in the parking lot, and when you go in, you know exactly where he stands. So people aren't afraid of the truth, um, but they do want their leader to state where they stand. So I would just ask that you do that as we go forward. All right, thank you, Aaron. And and as a, you know, one of the one of the things about I have. <laughs> said this in a, in a sermon here back in 2019, I, I hold to a traditional view and understanding of scripture. If, and that's a, I know that sounds contradictory to those of you who are looking at me going, well, but you want to stay in the United Methodist Church? Well, so yeah, I, I, I appreciate that feedback, Aaron. And I don't, yeah, well, I think that the, to have the conversations it is crucial. 
Because while I don't mind telling you what I believe on this, I'm not afraid to listen to what someone else's opinion on it is either. So thank you. Uh, this is tough. I uh, used to work in a profession that uh, required getting up and speaking in groups and uh, don't do it much anymore, but it's just as uh, scary and intimidating now as it was then. I'd like to share with you, uh, and, and I, I am sensitive to the time, but I, I'd like to share with you three things that I'm absolutely certain about that is helping me in the discernment process that we're going to go through to stay the course or leave the United Methodist Church. First, this is a great church with great people. It's a destination church. Uh, destination means, as a marketing term, that basically, as in the context of church, it means that most of us drive by at least three churches to come and partake in the fellowship here and to serve here and to support this church. It is a destination church in this community. It has great people. It makes up, Lynn and I have been here about 17 years, and it makes up the fabric of our spiritual life and our social life. Our friends are here. Our best friends are here. Our besties are here. Our BFFs are here. Best friends forever. You know what I mean? Best friends forever. We have a great pastor. He's a man of God. He's filled with compassion and love. And he has led this church in a defined mission to be a harbor of hope in a chaotic world. And he has done a great job keeping us on mission and helping us to accomplish that mission. The next thing that I'm certain about is that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. I get up every morning and I desire to know Jesus Christ and experience Jesus Christ more intimately, to love him more intently, and to follow him more closely. I believe there is a transformation process that goes on in the believer of Jesus Christ where Almighty God, through the power of his Holy Spirit, transforms followers of Christ into becoming a little more like Jesus every day. And that is why I think the forefathers or the founders of the Methodist Church established the mission of the Methodist Church to make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If the Methodist Church was following that mission statement and making disciples of Jesus Christ, the world would be transformed. We would not have the problems in this church and most churches that we are experiencing if we were on a daily progressive process of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And the third thing that I'm absolutely sure about is that the Bible is the inspired, God-breathed Word of God. It is useful for teaching. It is useful for correcting. It is useful for rebuking. And it's useful for training in righteousness so that the people of God are complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work. So those are the things that I'm certain about. Good church, good pastor. I know Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And the Bible is the inspired, God-breathed, inerrant, holy, authoritative Word of God. Now I'm going to share with you some things, and I'm going to try to be brief. I know it's Sunday afternoon. It's the third quarter of some football game. <laughs> but my feelings 
is that there are some things going on in the United Methodist Church that are much more concerning and much more complex than the issue of sexuality and what the Book of Discipline says about prohibitions on marriage and ordinations of the LGBTQ community. The issues are much more complex than that. There is a organizational and a theological dysfunction going on in this denomination that we need to be aware of before this comes to a vote. Hopefully, whoever is leading up the task force will make a concentrated effort to educate us on what's going on within the greater denomination. It does make a difference on how this church moves into the future. We have to look at what's going on in the greater denomination. There is abuse of authority. There is a total misinterpretation of the Word of God, a liberal interpretation that's relative, that's wanting to bring in and interpreting Scripture, the culture, human reasoning, life experiences, and oh, by the way, you need to look at the Word of God also in understanding and interpreting God's Word. Interpretation has to stand on the authority of God's Word. And the Methodist Church is moving away from that, in my opinion. We are not the church that John Wesley founded back in the 1700s. I think he would be appalled at where the United Methodist Church has come. We're not the church that Paul and the apostles of Jesus Christ started in the first century. I think they would be appalled at where the United Church has come. And I just hope that the, first off, the task force, and I know you're going to make a concentrated effort that it be a cross-section of the church, young and old new Christians, mature Christians, people for leaving the United Methodist Church, people against leaving the United Methodist Church. Some of the task force that I have read about that are leading up these discernment processes are 15 to 20 members large. It is a heavy, heavy process. And it needs to be a spiritual discernment process not just a discernment process. A spiritual discernment process will list both options. Stay the course, stay with the United Methodist Church. Other option, leave the United Methodist Church. List the pros and cons of both options. Have discussions on the pros and cons of both options. Determine what is fact and what is hyperbola or misinformation. And Finally, and most important, the process needs to be bathed in prayer. The discernment processes that I have read about, the spiritual discernment processes that I have read about, have a specific calendar of prayer with specific prayers and prayer vigils that take place during every day of the discernment process. I don't know whether I need to say anything else or not. I just know that this is a great church. But I am very concerned with the denomination with which we belong to. There is a lot of abuse going on, abuse of authority. Conferences are changing rules midstream. And here again, I know there's a lot of misinformation. I don't know whether what I'm stating is true or not, but supposedly the North Georgia Conference, the bishop came out earlier this week and stopped the discernment process. 
There will be no more churches voting on to disaffiliate or stay the course. He's just stopping the process. Excuse me. She is stopping the process. I am personally aware of churches that have been, of a church that has been torn apart by the actions of a bishop trying to remove a pastor from a church, the largest church in Atlanta. The person that she selected to go into that church as she was trying to remove the pastor just happened to be the pastor of my son's church in Atlanta. That church is about half the size today that it was when this whole mess started two years ago. The pastor that she was asking to be removed decided that he should not leave. The SPRC stood behind him. The administrative board stood behind him. And he was, the church was sued by the bishop. The church countersued the conference. And they ended up settling out of court several months later. This is not a denomination that I want to be, that I want the church that I'm attending to be associated with. So please make a concentrated effort as you lead us through this discernment process to one, bathe it in prayer, but make sure that we have all of the facts that tell truthfully what's going on within the greater denomination. Because I contend that where the greater denomination is going and is going to be 10 years from now is even more disturbing than what might happen to this church if we disaffiliate. Thank you. I changed my mind. Stand up. My name's Gene Thompson. For those who might not know me and those that do know me, I promise this is not going to be one of those times where I'll ramble on because I, I have done that before. Uh, <clears throat> well, and I, I forgot. I'm a. Let me get it in my head. I'm a Southern white, conservative, Christian, heterosexual, hardworking, law-abiding male. My back is not big enough to get another target on there, but bring it on if if, if it need be. I, I'm going to repeat something that's been said many times. This is not just about human sexuality in this in this. Uh, denomination. It's not even about the United Methodist Church. It goes much farther than that. It's about, it has been mentioned, this cultural and spiritual battle war we're in. I can handle these targets on my back. I can't handle this much longer. I really can't. I don't know how much I've prayed about this. Uh, Y'all know what I'm saying. Surely to goodness you know what I'm saying. If you're, you're here, so you got to know what I'm saying. And I just want to leave you with two statements. Now sit down right quick now and see. One I've heard all my life. One, I don't know, 25, 30 years. I can't remember. Maybe y'all can tell me. The first one is God is a, well, I'll even state it a different way maybe. My God is the same today as he was yesterday and as he will be in the future. Everybody's heard that. Everybody knows that. Does everybody believe that? I do. I don't know about that, but, but I do. The other one, and we've already heard this tonight too. I don't know, 30 years ago, first time I ever heard it. I said, what does that mean? Let's agree to disagree. I didn't really understand what that meant, but I said, well, we're talking about, she loves chocolate ice cream, I like vanilla. And if we disagree over that, we can give our opinions, but it's ice cream. 
I can even I can even say the the other jersey that I don't wear in politics, I can see their side sometimes. Not a lot, but I can see their side sometimes. But that's something different too. When we're talking about agree and disagree over this, that's when I have a problem. Because one of the factions, one of those factions is saying, I don't necessarily agree with that. And, and maybe that's okay. I don't know. But, uh, and John, I know where I'm going. I'm going to heaven. Um, is everybody, again, I told you to stay here as long as we needed to stay. If anybody would like to stay longer. I, okay, I, I've got, I got a motion to adjourn from Wanda. Do we have a second? Um, this is Dennis Lee. He has the rare privilege of being our lay leader at a time such as this. And I can't, couldn't think of a better person to be our lay leader. If you know Dennis, you know his heart, you know his passion, you know his commitment to Christ. The lay leader's role in our denomination is very important. And Dennis will have be a part of this whole process. And again, I can't think of a better person to have helping lead this process. Same goes for Hap Smith, who's our administrative board chair. These are people that most of you know. And if you don't know them, <laughs> please take my vouching for them. We are gifted to have these folks be a part of this leadership. Dennis, would you pray for us as we get ready to go? As you can tell by being here, first of all, thank you. As Steve said, and as many of you said, this isn't as Gene said, and time and time again, this is not easy. This is really hard work. But important work is often hard work. Thank you for hearing each other. And as being in this room, you can see there are people in different places. Remember, and I can, it's crazy. I, I love you all. I care deeply about the future of this church. And, and, and Aaron's right. I, I can't help but influence to some degree but simply because I'm your pastor. And I'm going to lead as best I can based on who God's called me to be. And I've, I hope I've been here long enough to where you know that's from a place of honesty and integrity. And I pray humility. And so it's okay if we're on different pages on this uh, from my perspective. But just know I love every one of you. And while we may have places where we bump up against each other, know that that love is not conditional, nor is it optional from me to you. And I pray for you to each other. Uh, and so with that spirit of Christian love, the understanding that this has been hard, and with us pleading with the Holy Spirit to make a way, I'm going to ask Dennis to come and pray for us. Well, you opened the door for me. Uh, <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything, but I, I do want to say just a, a couple of things, and I promise I won't stay long. Uh, some of you have heard me say this before, but I, I think one of the biggest problems we have in organized religion, the United Methodist Church, is if you go back to the New Testament, they were home churches. I, I believe in my heart that the church was never meant to be a corporate entity. Never. And I may offend someone when I say this, but we can thank our Catholic brothers when Constantine decided to make Christianity a national religion. And it wasn't because he was a strong Christian. It was because it was politically expedient for him to declare the church as a national religion. And we've been going downhill ever since. So I, I regret that. The second thing I would say is if you have factual information factual information. Please, please share it with us. Uh, I, I shared this with Steve the other day. I said, the thing that irritates me so badly, and it's on both sides of the aisle, 
It's when someone comes up and says, well, there's all this misinformation out there. There's all this information that's not factual, but they never have the courage to name what it is. Have you noticed that? You notice that? They'll say, well, that's, that's, that's not true. That's not factual. That's, that's been made up. Well, what's not factual about it? Tell me. So I'm smart enough to make up my own mind if I know the facts. So uh, uh, just please, please, if you have factual information, please bring it to our attention because that's what we're looking for because that's what we want to collect and gather and share back to the larger body. Please don't hold back if you've got it. Can we go to God in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, these are indeed turbulent times. And um, there's a lot of chaos in your church. Not, not just in the Methodist church, in your church at large. Uh, we've turned our back on you in many ways. We've decided that uh, we're almost back <laughs> in the day of the judges where everybody does what's right in their own mind. And uh, we saw what the results of that was. So, Father, I just I come to you this evening to ask you to open our eyes, our ears, our minds, and our hearts. To let your Holy Spirit speak to us as only it can. More importantly, Father, I ask you to give us the courage and the willingness to yield our will to, will, to the will of that Holy Spirit. Uh, because it will lead us to where you want us to be. And I just pray that each one here this evening, as well as those that aren't here but are part of this body of believers, uh, will approach all of these issues with, uh, with love and respect and humility. Uh, share your thoughts, share your opinions, um, so that we can, we can really understand where one, each other stands. And so, again, I just pray that uh, you would guide us and direct us and lead us along the path that you would have us follow. Give us wisdom and discernment and courage. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Have a, have a good night.